to a brand new series of Animal Park. I'm Kate Humble. And I'm Ben Fogel, and we're literally surrounded by animals here at Longleat Safari Park. Now, during the series, we're not just going to be getting really close to giraffes and zebras, but all 400 animals that live here. We'll also be meeting Lord Bath and getting an exclusive look at his house and estate. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. Two new lion cubs need to have their injections... And it looks like there are a couple of chips off the old block. Something's got to be done about Marmite, the marmoset problem child. He's having a good time in Darren's office this morning. <laughs> He's too much fun for his own good. He'll come back to no office, but... <laughs> and it's round-up time in the wild west of Wiltshire. But there's a showdown brewing. But first... A story of true love. Last summer, Honey, the lonely ostrich, found her luck was in when a handsome young bachelor came to live at Longleat. His name was Trevor, and he arrived from Marwell Zoological Park with his keeper, Gordon Campbell. That's female. Yeah, look at her. Playing matchmaker was Longleat's Andy Hayton. Yeah, he's cool. He came off, he didn't attack anybody, so... That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> you can't really ask yeah. more than that, can you? No. His hormones have been rising at, at Marwell and he's been displaying a lot, um, displaying at us when we drive by and so on. So, you know, once he's had a day or two to settle in, he'll be pretty interested in her, I would think. But it didn't take days, more like seconds. In fact, for Trevor and Honey, it was love at first sight. And then the trouble started. With the flush of young love coursing through his veins, Trevor came over all macho. He started strutting his stuff at just about anything that moved and jealously guarding his gal. Now, if you, if you look round at him now, he looks very interested in the camera. He's been rather vain. Oh, yeah. oh, uh, there we go. He's probably just seen his reflection in the lens <laughs> as well, so, Mark, you might want to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, just looking at him this close, I have to say, that was very brave for our camera. He didn't even flinch. <laughs> um, he's got a very red bill. I've never noticed that yeah, before. Yeah, what they'll do is they'll get really red legs um, and a red beak when they're in full-on kind of breeding mode. Right. I, I guess it's kind of a signal to other males, stay away because I'm really aggressive. And these things, they've got a really big eye. You can see that yeah, their, their eye in eyes. relation to other birds is the biggest eye in the, in the bird world. Wow. Um, and their brain is, in fact, smaller than their eye. <laughs> so, and that, that's, that's, that's quite true. a worrying fact, So actually, when you've got it? something that is that aggressive and that stupid yeah. and that fast and that powerful, you kind of... You've you're, got you're to be very careful when you're But if you can them. see his, his feet, you look at the claws he's got on his feet. Yeah. You know, we've seen Jurassic Park and the Velociraptor bit in the kitchen. Yes. I mean, these are direct descendants from dinosaurs. Um, and he would really carve you up if he got hold of you. I mean, these are... Yeah, I mean, really he's... extremely dangerous animals. You just wouldn't get off the motor, off the back of the pickup and start messing around no, with them. No, no, just... absolutely not. <laughs> Trevor's raging hormones were causing havoc. But what everyone at Longleat wanted to see was results. And it wasn't long before Honey began coming up with the goods. Eggs, and plenty of them. Unfortunately, this only made Trevor worse. Chasing us, is, that, is, is he literally trying to keep us away from the nest? What he's going to do is he's just going to be quite territorial about honey there on the eggs. Um, I'm guessing he's just going to come up, check us over. See if um, we're a threat or see not. See if we're a threat or not. Now, if we were on the back of that pickup, then maybe he would see us as a slight threat. Now, that, that wing thing he's doing, is that, does that mean anything? One left, right, it's, left, right? I, th I believe it's just all part of his... Um, I wouldn't say aggression, but he's just trying to make himself look as big as he possibly can. He's trying to, trying to threaten us and just keep us away from honey and the eggs. And uh, I've got to say, it works most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Will she sit on there exclusively? or um, No, or they she... take it in turns. Male ostriches are, are uh, pretty good like that. Are they very modern? 
very modern. They take their turn. Very modern men do like to take their turn. But Honey will do most of the sitting during the day. She will get up from time to time and go off and have a little bit of feed, etc. Um, but uh, especially in the wild as well, the males do a lot of the sitting in the evenings because obviously in in a wild situation where you've got predators about, um, the night time is the more dangerous time. Is he okay? He, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as long as you don't um, flap around too I much. I promise I'm no threat to you. <laughs> We're just checking <laughs> up on you. <laughs> There were 16 eggs in the nest, but no way to know how many of them were fertilised. In the wild, only about one in ten eggs actually hatch. So now Trevor, Honey and all the keepers will just have to wait and see what happens. Up in Lion Country, there's some big news from Mafui's pride. Keeper Bob Trollope has something to report. We've got a little surprise for you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we walked in here and we found we had some new additions. Um, Sazi has actually had a couple of cubs. And this is the first time anyone, apart from us keepers, have actually seen them. So if you want to come in, we're, uh, we'll just keep to the side because the others are in at the moment. So. If you look just over here, we've got Sazi and two cubs. She's pretty good as well, very protective, which you want her to be, but she does calm down quite, quite quickly. So we are able to sort of stay in here a little bit longer than normal. The bonny little things, honestly, two little girls. The twins are just six weeks old and don't yet have names. Zazie is still quite young herself. She was born in the lion house here just four years ago, so she's not an experienced mum. Luckily, she only had the two, so it's not a huge amount of work to do. But, uh, she just picked one up there. So. <laughs> she does everything properly. She doesn't pick them up for no reason. She only ever picks them up if she thinks that she needs to move them for some reason. I suppose the reason she'd done it then is because we were in here. She hasn't seen any strangers before. She's just been a little bit protective. Outside the lion's den, the perimeter fence is being replaced. So, for the contractor's safety, Mafui and the rest of his pride are locked in the pen next to Zazie and her twins. The other lionesses are very interested in the babies. Luna and Yendi spend a lot of time up against the cage, just watching them. And that's a learning process as well, because they're watching what Zazie does, and then if and when they have cubs, they've learned something from her, and hopefully they'd be able to benefit from this sort of close contact. You know, we're not going to let them in together yet, you know, not for several weeks. But just by being able to sort of put them up against the mesh, you know, they're bonding all the time with the rest of the pride members. The pride smell is very important, you know. If we were just take another lion and just stick them in here, obviously that's a foreign, foreign animal to them. So instinctively, they would investigate it and possibly kill it. When the cubs were first born, the keepers also needed to be careful about their own smells. We've only touched them once, and that was to check what sex they are, and then immediately we brush them over with some dirty straw, which has got mum's smell on, just to try and get our smell off as quick as possible. And it's basically seconds that we, we hold them for. The thing is, we don't need to pick them up and cuddle them. Our way is to keep them as wild as possible, and then you can work with them easier. If you've got tame animals and they run up to you, it's, it's just a little bit harder to sort of do anything properly. And they behave better if they're, if they're wild. But the wilder they are, the harder they are to get hold of. And later today, the keepers need to catch the cubs to give them their first inoculations. It's going to be tricky, but it's got to be done. Elsewhere at Longleat, there are some more new arrivals. And these are a lot easier to handle. I'm down in Pet's Corner with Keeper Bev Allen and two very sweet new additions to the park. Bev, who have we got here? Um, this is Honey because she's a nice brown colour, <laughs> very cute. Very sweet. Yeah, and, and also then... this is Carla 
Um, and she's um, a lop-eared rabbit. Cause you Hence can the, the floppy ears yeah, going down there. the floppy ears. Um, and how old are they? They're only about eight weeks old now, so they're very young. I yeah. can't get over how soft they are. I never <laughs> want to put her down. <laughs> they are lovely. And there's um, so many different types of breeds that you can get um, now as a, as a pet. Um, and it's just um, basically trying to find one that suits you and the one that you like right. the most. You can get long head ones, angoras and things, which you've got to spend a lot of time actually grooming them. So if you haven't got time to do that, get short haired rabbit okay. which is going to be better good advice now yeah. this is their enclosure presumably just behind you um yeah this is their new enclosure with lots of very telly tubbies oh it is yeah <laughs> i'm sure they're gonna love it <laughs> now are they allowed to go out now can we can we pop them down and um, they're not able to go out yet because okay. they've only just arrived um so we've got to get them settled in because there's different noises and things with lots of public around right. um also we've got to do a health check on them as well which right. we'll go around on the inside okay. area and do oh so they have a nice indoor space do they to um to live for the yeah they've got a nice big indoors area right. to go to um, we've got five rabbits all together right and you all live in here it's nice and warm okay there that we looks are. very cozy <laughs> yeah. are we going to go inside yeah we'll go inside okay i'll follow you in yeah. and um and what are we going to do now before right we're going to do a bit of a health check and, right. and sort of check their teeth first which is the main thing so right. you need to get them like that okay put them on there yeah sort of upside down but gently sort like of hold that? them yeah and just gently try and have a look at their teeth which is not there we are. Oh, there you they go. That Gosh, they're quite big, aren't they? They are. And you've got to make sure you give them things to gnaw on. Um, right. Because is that can, so they don't grow too long? That's it. They can grow too long and get out of line. Um, so then you have problems with them. So right. You, but that looks fine. That um, looks good. Nice should, we check, should we check this one? Yeah, check Carla's. So what do I do? Just lift the lips? Um, yeah, it's by the side. <laughs> oh, there we go. And you can see the bottom one. And they should be a very healthy white colour, should um, they? A white colour because they're young as well, yeah. but as long as they don't look too long, but they seem fine there as well. Okay, that's the um, teeth done. That's the teeth. Check the eyes now. Okay. Um, just We'll check honeys and... And what are you looking for? Just to make sure there's no discharge from the eyes. As you can see, they look very sort of brightly, um, you know, quite clear and everything yep. here. What are your eyes like? Ooh, very blue. Yeah. <laughs> very cute colour. Okay. So we're um, happy with the eyes? Yeah, the eyes look perfectly. Now it's the ears. Okay. You've got to sort of just check inside. Um, and it should be nice and clear because you've got to make sure they don't get ear mites. Right. Um, it can be a bit of a problem. And if you have a, a rabbit as a pet, is this something you should do regularly? Um, it is, yes. You need to monitor the health always. So when you get them out to handle them, it's a good um, sort of time just to give them a check over. Yep. Check the ears um, all the time. And the, the eyes you can see all the time, so just make sure they're nice and yep. sort of clear. Um, and also you should check their claws here right and um, because they can get quite long especially if they're in the hutch and they've got enough space to run around ours are lucky because they're able to get out right. and and you can actually trim them but it's always really like a dog's claws or a like cat's a dog's. claws but yeah. you, you need to be um know how to do it and be confident in doing it so it's okay. best to take it to the vets right. get them to show you how to do it and if you feel comfortable and doing it yourself you can do it from then on okay okay next one is the bottom oh that's <laughs> nice <laughs> so you just gently sort of hold it hold their back yeah. areas like that and have okay. a look and they look quite clear just make sure they haven't got runny poos okay um, and you can see they both look very sort of clean and clear and obviously that would be to do with diet wouldn't it it would be too much um green food especially for young rabbits um you shouldn't give them any sort of green foods until they're probably about six months old um so you know you've got to sort of monitor it uh, and but they look fine yeah just give them dry mix and that at night and they should be fine great so how long before these guys can go outside it'll probably be for a couple of weeks until they settle down and hopefully they can go out excellent well bev thank you very much we have two very healthy rabbits and of course we'll follow their progress throughout the series aren't you sweet Up in the big game park, there are three youngsters amongst the herd of Ancoli cattle. Today, they're in for a shock because they need to have a drench. That's a vaccination that is given by mouth. And to do that, the calves will have to be separated from their mothers. So it's time to round them up and cut them out. Well, we're bumping across the park. I'm here with head of section Tim Yeo, and Tim is actually being John Wayne. What's going on? We're trying to get the herd of Ancoli into the, what we call the jungle lock so that we can do some work on the three calves to actually give them um, a, a, a drench okay. uh, orally. I can see Kevin over there in one vehicle, and you've got the tractor as well. Uh, shouldn't you be on horseback? If I could ride a horse, it would really would be, <laughs> That's it would be good. <laughs> But they do look like they're behaving fairly well. I mean, is this a stressful procedure for them, being rounded up? When we actually get to separating the calves from 
their mothers. We were always trying to keep that sort of level of stress down. Do you want me to jump in and close the gates? Or... Yes, we could do that, Kate, yes. OK. Please, yeah. Hang on, let me... That's uh... right. So that's that. Well, that was amazingly easy. Amazingly easy. You obviously had words with them this morning to make sure that they behave themselves. What's the next stage now that they're in here? We want the calves away from their mothers in a right. safe area so that the vet Duncan can yeah. administer this drench. Okay. And it's an oral drench, it's a small bottle which is just tipped down the, the throat. These calves, what sort of age are they? Five to six months. So they've age. never I mean, been separated from are they are they still feeding they, from the mothers? They they are, yes, they right. are. And they and they have I mean they've been separated once before. They have actually two drenchings. But is it a time that you worry about them? Can it be quite stressful for the calves and the mothers? Obviously if we're to do the job safely for us, yeah. we have to separate them quite obviously from mum because mum will not take kindly not to you grabbing her calf. So I don't know, probably can remember Herb, yeah. who's the hand reared animal. Yeah. We will try to keep Herb back. Okay. Uh, then that will comfort the calves, you know, uh, with Herb there. Good. Even though it's not mum, good it, 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 it comfort's them good and they idea. go to her. Okay, so. well, Tim, we'll obviously be here to lend a hand, tell me what I can do. Join us a little bit later to find out whether we actually can get these calves separated from their mums. I am nervous. Back on the other side of the park, Trevor and Honey Ostrich would like to announce the arrival of their new baby. From their first clutch of 16 eggs, they've now got one precious chick, and everyone's over the moon including keeper Ryan Hockley. It's doing really well. I mean, it's really sort of, <laughs> really sort of good and strong, you know. It's bright, alert, it's, it's always looking to feed. You know, all the typical things, really, you're looking, I think, from ostriches. They're not an overcomplicated animal by any stretch of the imagination. It's just those instincts, following the parents, which it does brilliantly, feeding well, and it looks good and strong as well. So, yeah, we're really, really pleased. The first sort of mother and father reared, you know, natural sort of ostrich chick. So, again, you know, we're always sort of looking to better ourselves, and I think, you know, we've, we've done really well so far this season. The baby has been named Al. In the wild, it's the males that do a lot of the uh, postnatal care with the chicks. Um, because he's a, a big, strong, dominant animal, uh, Survival-wise, the chicks have the best chance if they stay with Dad. But uh, what we're finding, although Trevor... I mean, Trevor's not doing anything wrong, but we're finding that Honey probably is being the most defensive of the two. Mum and Dad are keeping their eye on Junior, but ostriches are not known for their grasp of road safety. The chick has brought traffic to a standstill. The baby sits in the middle of the road. Um, because the road is actually hot. One of our big concerns is that somebody will actually come down here and drive over the chick, which is a big shame, but we don't try and intervene and, and, and keep pushing the baby off the road because it just upsets Trev and Honey so much. We're just relying on um, the visitor's good nature and good sense not to, uh, not to squash the baby. We've got signs out warning people. Just hope that's enough. As well as the danger of being run over, there's also the risk of being trodden on by one of the zebras or giraffes that share the enclosure. Like any mum, Honey is taking every threat to her baby very seriously. Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner got these shots with his own video camera. We've had a few um, exciting bits have happened. The drafts came down, the baby ostrich was just over there. And of course, one of the drafts got too near, so mum decided that was too near and literally chased the draft off. And literally, it was on the, on the video camera, they got this draft being scared off by an ostrich with the ostrich chased up. Right away, out of the way. So it's quite, a, you know, it's quite... A bit of a strong thing to do to chase a giraffe. 15-foot giraffe's there and little birds there chasing it away. Two months on and the chick is growing fast. We'll be back later in the series to follow the progress of Trevor, Honey and Little Owl.
Vet Duncan Williams has got to come down today and administer some drugs to the new Ancoli cattle calves. And so what Tim Yeo, head of section, and I are trying to do with the help of tractors and some of the other staff is to separate off the calves from the rest of the herd, which sounds simple, but Tim, <laughs> it's potentially a nightmare, isn't it? It certainly is, Kate, yes. This, this is the potentially dangerous bit for us because a mother that has had her calf removed yeah. turns really very aggressive. To them, you're threatening their offspring. They are very dangerous. So are we at kind of at a so, point to let Certainly them we, out? we can, yes. We've got Herb there. The this is the brown and white, white one. one. So, yes, she's going to be the one protecting the car or sort of keeping the calves calm. That's it. We really want to try and keep her if we can, okay, yes. Okay, so, crikey, so we've got to try and keep Herb in there, get all the others out. They're going to be slightly cross and they've got very, very big hordes. This could be scary. Okay. Well, I'll give them some of the gate here. Keeper Kevin Nibbs is driving the tractor trying to split the calves from their mothers. So he's the cowboy while Tim takes the role of marshal, controlling the gate. But the cattle have the tractor outnumbered. The roundup could turn into the Battle of the Little Bighorn. We use the tractor because the horns can quite easily damage the vehicles. They will come at you head down extremely fast and yeah. with, with great energy. Do you think if they charged, you'd just sort of get hit in the middle by the head, but not actually by the horns? They probably would knock you first. Then they would probably they would use these the horns to uh, administer quite nasty... Uh... Quite nasty injuries. Come on. Come on, girls, come on. But here comes the bull. We, we certainly want him out. He weighs over half a tonne, and he's got the biggest horns of the lot. But Herb is going to try again, isn't she? She's, she is. She again. really is. The bull is staying close behind us, and it looks like he's itching for a showdown. This is really a point when you realise you just haven't got enough eyes. If we just okay. go back, all of us go back that way. Well, as you can see, there is the bull and coley, and um, rather sensibly, we've jumped back into the car. I'm safe in the vehicle, but Tim needs to carry on working the gate. Time to call for reinforcements. Bex, do you think I could call on that, that bit of help? We need your other tractor up here to give Kev a hand in the, in the lock. Here comes the cavalry to the rescue, in the form of keeper Becky Kendrick. We've now got Becky, who's one of the rhino keepers here, with another tractor, so that between her and Kev, they can try and encourage the rest of them to come out. With two tractors working together, they're starting to make progress. But the bull isn't the only one who's not in a good mood. Here's a cow who clearly has just realised that she's been separated from her calf. Um, the cattle that have already um, left the enclosure all bomb down through the park, presumably in a kind of great rush, thinking the calves were in amongst them. And I think she's just realised that the calf isn't there. And she's coming back furious. Where's my baby? I'm staying right in here. The brown and white cow you can see at the front there, that's Herb. And Tim was really hoping to be able to keep Herb in with the calves because she could be a bit of a calming influence and because she was hand-reared, she's easier for us to deal with. But she's done it, Anna. Well, I think that is the last of the Ancoli cows out of the enclosure. We've got the three calves, so... <laughs> 
keeping an eye out here. Join us later when hopefully Fat Duncan Williams will be able to administer the drugs and we can reunite calves with mothers. There are new arrivals all over the park. In fact, youngsters are popping up everywhere. I'm up in Wallaby Wood with keeper Bev Evans, and we've come to catch up with some of the newborn joeys here. Now, Bev, how, how old are these little guys? Um, a lot of these uh, joeys sticking their heads out at the moment are about five, five and a half months old. And how long would they stay in the pouch? It's around about nine months old, and at nine months they're popping in and out slightly, just building up their confidence, really. Now, obviously, the mums are chewing on bread and, and various other things yes. here. What would the joeys be eating now? Um, they will pick at a few things, a little bit of grass, sometimes a beech nut, a little bit of bread, but nothing, you know, um, very solid because at the moment they're still on their mum's milk. And so how do they get the milk in the pouch? Um, the mum's actually got four teats inside the pouch, um, so wallaby has a bit of a choice, really, <laughs> okay. in size. And is there always only one wallaby in the pouch? Um, yeah, um, although there could be um, a young joey outside who's not fully weaned yet. You, you'll have one outside, one in the pouch, which is very young, around about five months old, and then she'll still have um, a, an egg as well she's holding, which has already been fertilised. So when the joey leaves the pouch, that egg will go straight in and she'll be pregnant again. So it's so a continual it's, cycle, she's really? She's basically continually pregnant, probably three joeys. And do the little joeys ever come out? Sometimes, if it's really, really quiet, they'll, they'll you know, put the joey out for a bit, give it a bit of a lick and a clean, and then put it back in again. But um, So literally doing the spring cleaning in the pouch? That's right, yes, <laughs> yes. They really are absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Bev, thank you very okay. much. Here's what's still to come on today's programme. We've got the Ancoli calves separated. Let's get the big one then in the corner. But there's still the tricky bit. <laughs> in the great house, I'll discover some heavenly treasures. So this is the breakfast room, is it? It's really yeah. gold. It's 22 karat gold. Wow. And the new lion cub twins might look cute, but they know how to fight tooth and claw. So one bite or scratch is part of the job. <laughs> But first, we're going to Pet's Corner, where there's been some trouble. Marmite, the young marmoset, has been fighting with his dad. So he's had to be separated from his parents while a new home is found for him. Marmite always was a problem child. After a traumatic birth, he was rejected by his parents and had to be hand-reared. the keepers took turns as foster mum. One of them was Joe Hawthorne. The first few kind of months of his life, you know, um, it was quite touch and go, and we obviously had Tamara and ourselves, and um, you can see, I mean, he's, he's so agile and full of trouble now. So um, he's a nice, happy, healthy marmoset. But, yeah, it's been quite an experience. Um, he's had a mind of his own. <laughs> so and he's kept us all on our toes. So, you know, never a dull moment, really. As he grew up, Marmite was gradually reintroduced to his parents, Mike and Michelle, and soon they settled down together as a happy family. In, come on. But because he had been hand-reared, Marmite had lost his natural fear of humans. He was just too friendly for his own good, and that was a problem for head of Pets Corner, Darren Beasley. We had to really put some thought into how we were going to get him untamed. And obviously the, the obvious way is you go in like a, like a banshee and you, you shout and wave and scream and bang things. But mum and dad are already very timid already and very shy, so that would probably make them even worse. We don't want that, so it was fine a, a happy medium. So I asked all the, all the keepers to, to be scary. Uh, and whilst they are a scary-looking bunch normally anyway, we come up with what I think is the ultimate plan, if you want to see it. <laughs> are you ready for this? <laughs> OK. Now, is that scary? <laughs> it's just silly. The theory is that marmosets identify people by the shape of their face. So by changing that with the hat, it was hoped Marmite would no longer recognise Darren as his friend. So I'm just going in to feed them now, and they should all clear off when they see this horrible, noisy hat. Here we go. Can you see they've just retreated straight to the top of their box? 
I've got poor little Marmite. I don't know if you can see, he's just hiding behind the log here. All right, mate, there we are. See, his ears are flat back. Can you see he looks a bit... <gasps> What's that horrible, scary thing? He's hiding from me. And that's what we want. It sounds ever so mean, but we want this distance. He's not jumping on my shoulder. He's not trying to get in my coat. Um, because I've got this big, horrible, scary thing. And, and, and nothing in nature can prepare him for such a sh change in the shape. There's no way I want to scare any animal, really. I want them to be very wary. Unfortunately, the funny hat didn't fool Marmite for long. His lack of natural fear was likely to get him into trouble and could be dangerous. So a search began to find Marmite a new home. Back out in the park, the Ancoli cows are getting anxious about their babies. Three calves each need to have a drench, a vaccination that's given by mouth. Time for us to get down to the dirty work. Well, the calves are separated and uh, vet Duncan Williams is here. Uh, this could look a little bit upsetting. Obviously, they are a little bit stressed. They've been separated from their mothers, um, but they will be doing this procedure as quickly as possible so that they can be reunited. Okay, just one thing. They do sometimes kick out. Okay. Let's get a big one then in the corner. Oh, no. Yeah, just pull it out of the way. Yeah, got it. Can you go for this one, Pepper? Yeah, okay. Okay. So what's this for, Duncan? This um, This is a long run vaccine. All right, we lost the big one. Okay. It was a bit easier two weeks ago, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Grown a lot since you first did this. Yeah, okay, you can go. So this is a, a lugworm, you said? Lung, lung lungworm. Worm. Yeah, lugworms in the seaside. <laughs> the lungworm live in the bronchi and bronchioles and cause real bad um, infestation. They kills them, really. It's actually a live vaccine. Right. And um, they, they then need to... They then need to get exposed during the sort of grazing period. Which one are we going for? The big one or the white one? Big one. The lungworm larvae are picked up from the ground as the cattle graze, and they then work their way from the animal's stomach to the lungs. That's why the calves are getting an oral vaccine, in order to follow that natural process. The vaccine contains a specially cultured form of the worm larvae, which has been sterilised so that it cannot multiply inside the animal. Oh, well done, Tim. Good cat, right? Slide that board out of the way if you mind, okay? Yeah, got it. That's lovely, thanks. It's easier really without the boards, isn't it? You need to get your hands on them, don't you? That's going to go to its stomach. From there, it'll migrate to its lungs and they might cough a little bit with that, you know, when it gets into the lungs. Right. Okay, you can let them go. So it works exactly the same way as any vaccine that we might have. You're effectively giving them a little bit of the yeah. condition yeah. so that their body knows how to fight it. That's right, yeah. And is this it now for these calves? Can, can, are you going to leave them alone? Yeah, no, that's it. They had their first one two weeks ago. Right. Um, it's actually very a little bit older than we would normally do. Uh, you normally do them about two months old, but because the vaccine's only sort of produced in spring. Right. We had to wait on that. We had to wait. They were born, born late autumn, really. And off they go, back to join the rest of the herd. And I'm sure there are going to be some very happy and relieved ah, and Cody yeah. mothers and very happy and relieved Tim and Duncan. Young Marmite the Marmoset's lack of timidity has been getting him into all sorts of trouble. He's now had to be moved to a temporary cage in the pet's corner office, where keeper Joe Hawthorne can keep an eye on him. He's had quite a, a summer, really, because we've had him out for probably about half a dozen times. Um, and throughout that time, we've, we've had him out for kind of, you know, half an hour, an hour, and built it up over the time. But he's kind of been a bit more interested in, in what's going on and the, and the human beings around him rather than um, his, like, immediate vicinity. So, I mean, you know, we've kind of really tried to keep him in the enclosure with Mum and Dad, um, but he's had other things on his mind. Um, he's been to visit the parrots, and um, at one stage we kind of he disappeared off down the railway track. So, <laughs> yeah, all really interesting stuff. But when the keepers caught Marmite having a fight with his dad, Mike, it became clear that something had to be done. 
urgently. His wound's fine. I mean, I think probably Dad caught him on the head there. It looks fine now. Um, his hair will just kind of grow over and, yeah, it hasn't affected him in any, any way. <laughs> he's, he's still a little devil. <laughs> his parents seem happier now that the little devil has left home. And for a mischievous marmoset, the Pets Corner office is quite an interesting place. We're going to let Marmite out for a bit of exercise because he's obviously in this um, temporary holding at the moment. Obviously not, not for long, a couple of days. But while he's in here, we've got to let him have his, his exercise still. So it's your time for freedom, matey. You can come and have a run around, stretch your legs. Come on then, you coming out? Obviously, we do this under supervision, so, you know, one of us has got to be in the room with him while we let him out. Um, and um, I'm just going to sit over there and do some work, and hopefully he'll come out and just have an exercise for a bit. Come on, come on. Um, You can see he's having a good look at the cobwebs now. Oh, he's found a spider. That'll go down well. <laughs> time in Darren's office this morning. <laughs> He'll come back to no office, but... <laughs> he's having... Oh, he's got a leaf now. No, he's not. He's got a bit of tape. <laughs> you can't have that. Give that to me. Give it to me. Come on, you have your pen. That's it. Joe and all the keepers will be sad to see him go, but Marmite needs to be kept in a more appropriate place. That new home has now been found. I think he, he'll really be able to kind of start his, his own life there. Yeah, it'd be good. I'm really kind of excited for him, actually. It'd be nice to see him start his own little life, really. Longleat House is the home of the seventh Marquis of Bath. For over 400 years, his family have been collecting all kinds of works of art, so that now the place is often described as the treasure house of the West. Longleat House is chock-a-block full of antique furniture and paintings, but one of the areas often overlooked by visitors is up there, the ceilings. So I've joined Claire Mound, who's the head guide here, who's going to take me on a tour of the ceilings. So, Claire, can you tell me a little bit about this one in here? Well, Lord Bath's great-grandfather had travelled widely and fallen in love with Italy, and he came back having bought this painting, and he proceeded to Italianise this part of the house, putting in very formal ceilings. This painting, of course, bought in Italy, not painted here. Oh, so it was literally brought over here and then yeah, embedded into the ceiling. Yes. So, so that dispels the myth that painters, painters lie, lie on their, their backs, backs <laughs> painting not upside here. down. So each one is copied from... What, uh, very largely from the Ducal Palace in Venice. OK. And I've noticed on each corner there's a, a Latin word. Uh, yes, we've got poetry, art, science and history. And behind them, little paintings uh, of those particular scenes. So you've got uh, a scroll under science, you've got warlike things for history. It's absolutely fascinating. Where next? Shall we go down to the breakfast room? Let's go. The oldest parts of the house date from the reign of Elizabeth I. And over the centuries, untold wealth has been lavished on the decor. Wow, so this is the breakfast room, is it? This is the breakfast room. It's really Pretty grand. gold. It's really gold. It's 22 karat gold. Not solid, surely? No, gold leaf. Okay, that's still very <laughs> but it impressive. It still though. looks pretty good, doesn't it? And what about the painting here? It's a painting uh, based on one in, in uh, Italy. It's justice and peace, banishing discord, with the lion St. Marks. Now, the lion St. Marks is that little sort of dog-like animal with a collar. Not, not particularly not, ferocious. Not a very fierce lamb, but uh, it's still a lovely painting. Such a spectacular ceiling. Does it take a lot of, of maintenance and cleaning to keep it so pristine? Well, it has to be dusted every year, perhaps uh, taking away any cobwebs that might have crept in, but we don't have many of those at Longleat. Any uh, polishing? No. Gold doesn't tarnish. That's what's so magical about gold. Our next stop is a room once reserved for royal visits and special occasions. 
Wow, now this is a fantastic room. Where are we? We're in the state drawing room now, and this ceiling is copied from one in the library. Vincent Marks in Venice, uh, not the Doge's Palace. OK, and it's got a lot more paintings here. It's got circular paintings that were bought and put in here. Around the paintings, you've got fruit, pomegranates and apples, pears, maybe. And then you've also got the signs of the zodiac. Up here as well? Yes. I wonder whether I'm in what here. Are you? What I'm, are a, you? I'm a Scorpio. You're a Scorpio. Where have we got Scorpio? I think I Scorpio think is directly above us. Aha! There you are. I never knew that I was on the ceiling of Longleat House. That's another first for you then. <laughs> well, Claire, thank you for opening my eyes to a whole new world. And you can now walk around with your head in the air looking up. Absolutely. <laughs> Take advice. Next time you go to a stately home, don't forget to look up. In the lion house, Zazie's two new cubs are six weeks old and they need to have their first inoculations. They've never been separated from mum before and she's not going to like it. Keeper Bob Trollope isn't looking forward to this either. It's going to be a little bit noisy, a lot of screaming and playing at, but you know, it's, it's just what your normal domestic cat would have. The cubs themselves are not exactly defenceless, as the head of Big Cats, Brian Kent, knows. Obviously, they could do a fair bit of damage. They've got sharp claws, they've got sharp teeth. When you get that biting into your arm or your leg, it's going to hurt. So, you're going to know it. <laughs> so, you've got to know what to do. The first thing to do is to tease Zazie into a separate pen. <laughs> That's that then. That's the easy bit done, moving up. Now comes our two trainees. <laughs> two new recruits to the Lion team are being initiated into the art of catching cubs. First up is Stuart Sears. Duncan Williams, the vet, has come up from the Ancoli Roundup to give the injection. It's a triple jab that covers a variety of feline diseases. They're also getting an identity microchip inserted into the scruff of the neck. Oh, I mean, a lot of noise. They're obviously a little bit scared of what's going on. Obviously distressed because they're in here doing it. So they're both reacting off of each other. The last thing is a dose of worming solution. And now to catch the second cub. This one is either more feisty or else trainee keeper Duncan Turner hasn't quite got his technique right. Well, I've seen better, I must admit. It's a bit noisy, but that's what you expect. They're more frightened of us than anything. That's what all the fuss is about. They just want to get back in with mum as quick as possible. In fact, the whole business takes only a few minutes and Zazie is soon back with her cubs. But in four weeks' time, the trainee keepers are going to have to do it all again for the second round of inoculations. They're going to be a lot bigger and a bit more, you know, what to expect. So they obviously got to be a bit quicker doing it. <laughs> What's they going to get hurt? So one bite or scratch, get used to it. It's part of the job. <laughs> We'll be back for that later in the series and to follow Zazie's new cubs through all the dangerous days of growing up. Longleat's Half Mile Lake is home to the park's biggest animals. They rest in the water, feed on land and play in the stuff between. Mud, mud, glorious mud. Nothing quite like it for cooling the blood. So follow me, follow me. There's something comical about the hippopotamus. Certainly the sea lions that share the lake are always taking the mickey. But their appearance is deceptive. The hippo is very territorial and quite aggressive. So as well as being the heaviest animals in the park, they're also the most dangerous. 
I've come up to the hippo field with keeper Mark Ty, and we're hoping to catch a very close glimpse of two of the park's most elusive creatures. Now, if you just spin around, you'll see behind you the two hippos. Now, they're pretty close already, but we're hoping to catch them even closer. Mark, this is quite a dangerous kind of operation we're doing here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, they're incredibly fast-moving animals for something of... Um great bulk that they are. It always surprises me because they're ginormous, aren't they? Yeah, they are absolutely huge. I mean, they're sort of probably between two and a half to three tonnes apiece. And how fast could they move them? And they can move at about 25 to 30 mile an hour across the ground. Which a lot faster, a than, lot us, faster than us, yes. So we do have to keep our wits about us and keep a good close eye on them because, you know, they can, they can move very quickly. I've really never seen them even that close, so I'm very excited. So what are we, we going to put food down? Is that the plan? Yes, we're going to put their evening food down. Um, they are mainly a nocturnal grazer, mm -hmm. um, so that's why we put it down last thing in the evening for them and they should hopefully come over a bit closer then. OK, so can I give you a hand yeah. with some of this? Do you want me to...? We spread this out in a line. So it's a bit like cows, then, I suppose, if they're eating hay like this. Yes, um, they, they are just purely a grazing animal. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in the winter, we supplement that here with hay. Yep. Um, if you can keep it in a sort of fairly straight line. OK, then, along here. Yeah, because they're quite prone to just treading it into the ground. Of course, yeah, with their weight, yes. of course. Um, and do they eat? I mean, with the size of them, I imagine they must eat vast amounts of food. Yes, they do eat vast amounts of food, but luckily here we've got such a huge field mm -hmm. that they get most of their food from the, just grazing on the ground. Right. Um, we, you know, we actually, what we supplement them here is almost just a, a maintenance diet. They don't get any more than this. Right. One, sort of one, half a bale of hay, a few pony nuts and some bananas. So should we put, put some of this yep. down now? <clears throat> Bring that around. So they like yeah, bananas, they do they? absolutely <laughs> love bananas. They probably, wouldn't, they probably wouldn't find many of these in the wild. No, they, they wouldn't, no. <laughs> Just pop them down. But just break them up into sort of twos and threes and they'll be quite happy to pick through that. Right, and what should I do with this? Just pour it just all down? Just spread it in a line along the top of the hay. Good, please, Ben. Like that? That's it. That's great. Right, that's all the food down. So, um, can we just sort of hang on here and, and watch no, them that, No, that would be far too dangerous, to be honest. I mean, they, they hopefully will come over quite quickly, so we'd have to get into the truck and pull away a little bit. OK, should we do yeah. that, then? Yeah. After you. Mafui's pride is confined to quarters while their fence is being repaired, but Charlie's pride is still outdoors, so the lion keepers have some day-to-day -day work to do. They think it's routine. I think it's downright dangerous. Safe to get out, Bob? Yes, yes. Well, he says it's... I'm here with lion keeper Bob Trollope, and um, he's taking me out into the lion enclosure. Where are they? They're just over here. Quite yeah. far away, I hope. Well, far enough for us. <laughs> well, there's Brian there, so um, I'm feeling OK yeah. about this. <laughs> but is this entirely necessary? It's one of these jobs that has to be done. Right. Um, this is yesterday's dinner, and yeah. we're just going to pick up the bones. But can't you just leave them out here, though? I mean, don't they just like the bones to sort of chew on and Well, well you could it? do, but, you know, they, they eat tons and tons of meat a year. Right. So, obviously, they don't break down very quickly, so we would just have a massive... It would look like a sort of an old graveyard. An old graveyard, and that's not very good. Plus, I think there's a few regulations that stipulate that we must pick For them up. For health reasons. Because yeah. presumably, I mean, you know, in the wild, there isn't someone like you and as daft as me wandering around collecting up bones. No, this is very true, you know, because a piece of meat like this... Well, what this is a classic example. The lions are finished with this, yeah. but there's still food on there. Yeah. Um, in the wild... Other prey, uh, vultures would come in and yeah. strip this, jackals, insects even. Of course. And, you know, it was a perfect food chain. They do a very thorough job, don't oh, they? Oh, yeah, they, they could have stripped this even cleaner because their, their tongues are like rasps. It's very coarse hair on the tongue. Right. And it's used for cleaning meat and that would get all that sinew off, stripped, and Incredible. then nothing's wasted as such. And is all that, I mean, it sounds like a silly question, but is everything, sort of hair and everything, is that good for them or is that just sort Extremely of like the wrapping good when they for spit them. it you out? Know, they will use the hair, the hair, as it's been digested, will clean the tubes as such. Wow. And, you know, it's like a furball. You, you cough it up and you've cleaned your tubes. How incredible. Well, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to abandon you. No, that's fine, I'll carry on with the work. Up that um, Brian is doing the right thing over here. Now... Thank you very much, Brian. I do feel very safe with you here. I mean, 
it sounds like we're sort of hamming it up a bit. Is it really dangerous out here? It can be, yeah. You've got to be really careful. I mean, obviously, you're out in the, with the lions. Yeah. So you know to make sure that they're fairly safely away. Looking at them now, there they all they are, sort of lying down. <laughs> they look very kind yeah. of relaxed and chilled. Surely they're not bothered by us, are they? Um, they could do. I mean, there'd be times when they could catch you out. I mean, they could suddenly get up and run over. And could they cover that distance? I mean, what are we looking at? A couple of hundred metres? Yeah, very quickly, yeah. You'd have to be uh, moving your truck pretty quick. <laughs> but I'd give a warning shot on the gun anyway. Now, I was going to say, this gun, presumably you don't use it unless you absolutely have to. Yeah, I mean, as, you know, we don't get yourself in a position to get caught out. Right. You really have to be safe. Yeah. You know, I should be watching now. Yeah. As you're talking to me about. Sorry. Um, so you don't get in that position. Yeah. You know, you've got to be really careful. You keep and them out of distance. What are the sort of signs that might give you an indication to say, Oi, Kate, actually just walk slowly back to the car? Well, you get the ears going back. Yeah. Um, start stalking. Yeah. Trying to creep up onto you. Do they do that thing like domestic cats do, where the tw tail starts twitching? Yeah, the tail will be going, everything. I mean, you've got to be really careful. OK, well, I'm not going to distract you any further. I'm going to carry on with Bob um, as quickly as possible so that we can get out of here, Bob. Brian, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm back to work. Ready? Everyone loved Marmite the Marmoset, which is hardly surprising since the keepers all helped raise him from a baby. But his over-friendliness, mischievous nature and recent dominance fights with his dad meant that he had to be found a new home. It's now been one month since Marmite left and head of Pet's Corner, Darren Beasley, is still missing him. You won't come across a bigger pain in your life, you know. Every time I'm trying to write a letter, he's down there and he's playing with me ears and he keeps nicking me pencils and things. Uh, and generally, it was a real nuisance, but it was all a, a lovable sort of nuisance. Um, so when he went, it's a bit of a wrench, which, which means, you know, you have to be a little bit hard-hearted and you have to say, right, this is not what's best for me, Darren as a person, or the keepers, it's what's best for the, the monkey, for the marmosette. And I think we got the right decision. He's not only got a lovely new home, but he's got a whole load of common marmosets to be with. And generally, from what I hear, the reports I hear, he, he is doing really, really well. And the thing is now is that I want to go and see him and I want to go and say hello and see how he's getting on, but it's his new home, it's his new life. So I think at the moment, we're just going to leave him be, let him settle in, and, and hopefully, happy days, we're hoping. And uh, we'll have to, well, just watch this space and, and hope he gets on all right, really. With Marmite gone, his parents, Mike and Michelle, have the Marmoset house to themselves. But soon, that's all going to change, because now Michelle is pregnant again. There's a new baby on the way. Back down by the lake, the hippos are obviously very hungry. Mark, they've come over so quickly. Yeah, they, they sometimes do. I mean, sometimes they can be quite wary and stay out in the lake for a while until they're really happy. I mean, obviously, they've got time on their side, but sometimes, when, if they're obviously a nice day like today, they're quite keen to come out and get tucked in. Are they quite greedy animals? Yeah, they are, especially when we put bananas out. They do seem to have a real sort of taste for those. And is there either, are either of them more greedy than the other? <laughs> yes, the one on the right. Uh, her name's sort of, her proper name is Big Female. Although Big we, Female? Yeah, although we call her Sonia. Right. Um, she's a lot greedier, and she's quite prone to standing over the top of the food to try and stop the other one getting to it. That's a bit mean. Yeah, just a bit. So how long have these guys been here for? They've been here since 1976. Uh, they're both 28 years old now. And were they, were they kind of born in, it, in the UK or in...? in no, the... these, these were caught from Uganda. Really? Back, yeah, back then brought in as youngsters and they've kind of st been put out in this area which is obviously a big field and lake area and they've kind of remained pretty much as they should in their wild state. They're not at all friendly. With an animal like that, it's best it is in its wild, dangerous state because you know where you stand with it. I mean, if, if you get a tame one, you're not too sure what it's going to be like, but at least with these two girls, you know exactly what you're getting. But, of course, one of the problems with, with these guys is that they can hide so well, can't they? Yeah, once they're in the water, I mean, they literally, as long as they can put their nostrils out of the water, that's all they need. They can stay under for ages without being seen. It certainly looks like they're enjoying that. And the ducks, they don't mind them? Either way, I mean. <laughs> Sometimes they get a bit annoyed with the ducks, because obviously the ducks pile in there and steal all their food. But 
As you can see, she's standing over the top guarding it and the ducks aren't getting too close. And very wary of us. Absolutely, yeah. They are. Mark, thank you very much. What a privilege to get so close to two big hippos. and I have come up to the tapir paddock to catch up with Bev Evans and her three very hungry and very friendly tapirs. <laughs> very hungry, yes. Now, Bev, I've brought up this tub of, what is it, vegetable oil It's or vegetable something. oil, yes, that's right. Uh, we tend to put it on their food every evening. OK, um, which I they're very keen for. Can, okay. we, can we help you here? If what you should we? just pass the bowls around, yep. see if Jeffo wants to come over and, okay. and eat okay. it. Uh, there's Jeffo just over there. I'll, I'll take that one. Ernie will come across as well in a second. Okay. Now, what's this vegetable oil for, Bev? Um, we put it on their food and it does, you know, help their skin. They're in and out of the pond most of the day. Right. And they can get very, very dry skin, so it really just helps with the condition of their skin. There we go. So, so what do we do? Just pour... Uh, if you just a cup full, it's yeah. a bit messy work, it's but just drizzle it over the nuts and they don't mind it at all. Okay. Well, okay. well, this, is, this is literally going to improve their, their coat or their skin? A um, bit of both, really, to be honest. Mostly their skin, though. Because it's amazing how much more... Um, hair he has, for example, yeah. than, um, than mum and dad. Yes, Ernie's still got his baby coat. He's five and a half months at the moment. He's still got his few of his baby stripes and his baby coat, yeah. And why is it that their coat, their coat and their skin seems to suffer here? Because presumably there's no one running around <laughs> in the wilds of South American rainforests with vegetable oil That's for them. That's true. Um, out in the rainforest, it's, it's generally a lot more humid, a lot warmer. Um, there's all weathers uh, here in Britain, so, you know, the skin can get very, very dry. So it's a bit like us. We'll get sort of chapped hands and chapped lips in the winter, <laughs> and it's the same for the tapirs. Yes, definitely. No, no, don't lick me. Eat that. Um, well, sadly, that's all we've got time for today. We're going to leave the tapirs munching their supper, and here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Shandy the white tiger needs a major operation. It's touch and go whether she survives. You always got to keep your fingers crossed, but you've always got to bear in mind that the worst could happen. Jemima the giraffe is having a baby, but the birth is not going well. There are complications. You want two front legs first, but because it was only one leg out, we were worried that her other leg had been caught up behind her. And in Monkey Jungle, we'll be picking up some motoring spares left by the little vandals. Pieces like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's all in the next Animal Park.